Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Representative Carolyn Partridge, and it is uh, the 27th of January, 2021. And we are very fortunate today to have many folks from several agencies to talk about working land, the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. Uh, but I'd like to start off by having us introduce ourselves, our committees. And so I'll start by, I'll go around the tiles that I can see, and I'm gonna start with Terry Norris. I'm Terry Norris. I represent Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and Whiting. Thank you. And Heather, Heather is one of our new members. Well, Heather Supernat. I represent Barnard, Pomfret, Queechee, and West Hartford. Great. And another one of our new members, uh, Henry Pearl. Yeah, Henry Pearl. I'm, uh, I represent Danville, Peachum, and Cabot. All righty. Uh, thank you. And uh, John O'Brien. What do we have, three committees on here, Carolyn? Yes. Okay, right. So I'm House Ag, I'm John O'Brien. I represent Royalton and my hometown of Tunbridge. Thank you. And Rodney Graham? I'm Rodney Graham, represent Williamstown, Washington, Orange, Current, Verishier, and Chelsea. All right, thank you. And Vicki? Hello, I'm on the Ag Committee and I uh, live in Albany and serve seven towns in Orleans, Caledonia one. Thanks, Vicki. And Tom, I think you're the last per person on our committee. Uh, my name is Tom Bach. I represent the towns of Chester, Andover, Baltimore, and part of North Springfield. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. And well, hold on. I, I just want to say who I represent, Bobby. Um, uh, Carolyn Partridge, I represent the towns of Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of North Westminster, all of Rockingham and my hometown of Wyndham. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, and I, I'm Bobby Starr. I represent Orleans, Essex County, and, and our committee knows how to introduce themselves. So go ahead, guys, introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Chris Pearson from the Chittenden District Vice Chair of Senate Ag. Great to be with everyone. Hi, I'm Anthony Polina. I represent Washington County, Senate Ag. Brian Collimore from Rutland District, and this is my third term on Senate A. Uh, Corey Parent representing Franklin County and Alberg. Uh, this is my first go around on Senate Ag. Yeah, thank you. And we'll move on to uh, Representative Marcotte. Uh, thank you, Senator Starr. Um, I'm uh, Michael Marcotte. I uh, represent Coventry, Irisburg, Newport City, Newport Town, and Troy and I chair uh, the House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. And Charlie? Uh, Charlie Kimball, representative from Woodstock, representing Woodstock, Reading, and Plymouth, and Vice Chair. Stephanie? Morning, Stephanie Jerome. I represent Brandon, Pittsford, and Sudbury, and I'm the ranking member. Lynn? Dickinson, I represent St. Albans Town. I've been in the legislature since 2009 and have spent most of my time on commerce. Warren? Did you say Warren? I did Warren. Oh, okay, I'm Warren Kitzmiller. I represent Montpelier. And it's good to be back on commerce and economic development after a few bienniums up in GovOps. Paul? Good morning, everybody. It's uh, Paul Martin. I represent Franklin Five, which is the towns of Franklin, Highgate, Berkshire, and Richford. I'm a first term legislator. Emma? Good morning, everyone. I'm Emma Mulvaney Stanick. I'm a first term legislator from Burlington. I represent half of the old North End and half of the new North End. Glad to see everyone. Logan? Logan Nicole, uh, representing Ludlow, Mount Holly, and Shrewsbury. This is my second term. Last session, I was on human services. Michael? Hi, uh, Michael Nigro. I represent Bennington, and uh, this is my first term. Patrick? Hi, I'm Patrick Seymour. I represent Sutton, Burke, and Linden, and this is my second term. I was on judiciary. And Kirk? Hi, I'm Kirk White. I'm a first term legislator. I live in Bethel. I represent Bethel, Rochester, Stockbridge, and Pittsfield, and I am clerk of the Commerce Committee. 
That's our crew. Uh, just want to thank you, Chair Partridge and Chair Starr, for allowing uh, my committee to join you this morning. Uh, Working Lands has uh, been uh, not just for you all, but for Commerce, uh, a very important program, and uh, we're interested in hearing more about it. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks for, uh, it's so great to have so many folks here. Uh, and uh, so what I'd like to do now, we got good news from the governor yesterday in that there's uh, uh, $3 million uh, in uh, part of that's one-time money to be devoted to the program, but I'd like to turn it over to um, Anson. And Anson, could you tell us, are you gonna be here for the whole time? Uh, are you gonna be introducing folks? Uh, we really appreciate you being here today. Well, thank you, it's, it, it is great to be here. And I do have to scoot at about 11 o'clock. Um, the governor's having a, a news conference today and uh, they want me on standby to talk about working lands uh, because of the announcement that you uh, just made. And I'll, I'll have a little bit more on that. So. It is great to be here. I'll be introducing some folks uh, down the line. We have some uh, producers and farmers uh, that have uh, taken part in this program and they are the kind of the stars of this show and we'll get to them a little later in the program. But first, um, a little bit of background. Uh, it's great to have the Commerce Committee with us as well. Um, we're working very closely uh, with uh, Secretary Curley and everyone at Commerce. Uh, one of our missions is to break down the silos in state government and we've done that uh, working closely through this pandemic with uh, commerce so it's great to have a, have you all with us and i think you'll enjoy uh, our presentation of how important this is uh, to vermont so uh, again thank you for your support of working lands uh, this program is about helping people it's about helping places and helping our communities who make uh, their living off the land uh, we are thankful for your continued support of this program uh, since 2012. Yes, 2012. It's invested in all 14 counties, uh, funding $7 million in projects, uh, leveraging about $11 million, helping over 241 businesses. Impressive numbers. Uh, between 2012 and 2018, investments created over 500 new jobs and sales revenues of over $36 million dollars. That's impressive work and commitment uh, to our communities. This year, the governor is proposing historic funding for working lands. The governor, as he mentioned yesterday, has proposed investing $3.5 million in this program. We've never seen this kind of investment in one year. Uh, we hope you'll endorse, it, endorse this. Uh, tell your colleagues uh, this will grow Vermont's economy. Uh, make it more affordable and protect uh, the most vulnerable. Uh, the need is there. So we can, we can speak to the need here because uh, the board reviewed over 180 applications with a total ask of over $6.8 million uh, last year. So you can see uh, the need is there. And this program is successful uh, because of those behind the scenes who have put their uh, heart and soul behind this. And one of those is uh, Deputy Eastman, who's joining us via, via YouTube. We thank Deputy Eastman for chairing our board and helping us get through uh, um, all the work over the year and so forth. And also the dedication of board members. Uh, there's an independent board uh, that reviews all the applications that come before us. And that's done from a, a number of folks. One person we want to thank is uh, Ella Chapin. Ella, who has worked with hundreds of uh, farmers and producers over the years, um, has decided to move on uh, from farm viability, but her commitment to Vermont in this program is meaningful and will continue for years to come. So we salute Ella, and we, we know she'll continue to uh, support her community over her new journey. So thank you, Ella Chapin, uh, for your service to the board and to the service uh, for Vermonters. <clears throat> We also have another person that's uh, going to be leaving the, the board, and that is Eric DeLuca. A big thank you to Eric. Uh, he's been with, with Working Lands for a number of years. Uh, his term has expired, but Eric, uh, uh, Eric has done a tremendous job uh, leading this program, uh, getting his hands dirty and so forth. So we really appreciate um, his work on that. So those are a couple of things, I just overview of the program. I, I do want to turn it over to uh, the manager of this, uh, you know, Lynn Schmoller 
uh, does a, a lot of work with her team at the agency where it's managed. And I want to turn it over to uh, Lynn Allen, who has some more thoughts and we'll continue with our program. Lynn Allen. Thanks, Anson. Good morning. I'm Lynn Allen Schmuller. I'm the program manager for the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. Thanks for your continued support of the agriculture and forest drivers of Vermont's economic development, providing jobs, impacting acres favorably, and ensuring our rural economies flourish. It's a real pleasure to work so closely with the Working Lands Enterprise Board, Vermont Working Lands Businesses, and an honor to steward this important program nested within the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. As the daughter of a former independent grocer, I'm a longtime participant in supply chain activities and so understand the incredible dedication and behind the scenes complexity involved for a forest-based business or food producer to get goods to the shelves. Before arriving to the agency a couple years ago, I was director of purchasing and merchandising at City Market in Burlington. In my role at that co-op, I collaborated with the National Cooperative's grocers on co-op market expansion around New England, whose shelves in fact slot many of the products produced by the Working Land's current and past grantees. From increasing value add production, to market development, to hoop house construction improvements, to wood manufacturing facility upgrade, fiscal year 2020, even with the pandemic disruption, was no exception to the diverse group of enterprises that we love continues to decisively invest in. I know you'll enjoy hearing from the Working Lands Enterprise Board and the Working Land businesses today, and I want to thank you again for your good work and service to the state of Vermont. Secretary Tebbets. Thank you, Len Allen. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, just impressive work that you and the team at the agency and across the other agencies across state government have done with this program. Uh, it's been a really um, uh, difficult year, as we know, in the middle of this pandemic, but we've done some impressive work uh, over the years. Um, I do think it's now time if um, Eric is with us, Eric DeLuca, as I mentioned, Eric uh, has been with us and um, he has decided to move on and off the board, but over, I think it's nine plus years that Eric's been with us. Uh, his commitment to agriculture in the state of Vermont is impressive. And Eric, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Uh, you've been the vice chair of this, of this panel, and I'm going to turn it over for you for some thoughts. Eric. Thank you, Anson. Um, I wanted to thank all of the legislators that have, um, been part of supporting this program throughout its history from the ones who helped to get it created um, through its launch and development and then welcoming the new folks who are with us today to share this story. And if people do have further questions over time, I want to encourage them to reach out to Lynn Ellen or any of the other public sector leaders um, to learn more. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, could we go to the, uh, the, the next slide? Thanks. So, um, you know, this program, uh, when it first launched, had an overwhelming response um, from the businesses in the, in the working lands economy of Vermont. That, that first year, we had nearly 400 applications for about $10 million. We had around a million dollars to put on the ground. So that was a really strong indicator that this was something that was needed and a great opportunity for impact. Over time, we refined our approach and also um, the businesses and the service providers that helped the businesses got increasingly clear on how they could communicate with us and target the types of impact that would make the biggest difference. Um, what we've tried to do is to take a portfolio approach to how we um, help businesses. And at the core of that is our capacity to give grants to businesses, that's a relatively rare form of capital to be able to provide. And those grant dollars, when we've spoken with to other lenders and capital providers in the system, folks have consistently said that this is the best and highest use of our funds because it is something that, that's difficult or impossible for just about any other kind of capital provider to make available to businesses. And that money and its impact on the balance sheet of those businesses can help unlock other capital. And I'll be talking a little bit more about some of the leverage of the public dollars that we've been able to achieve uh, with our investments. Um, with businesses, we um, help businesses based on their scale and their stage of development and the markets that they serve. 
We have given um, small grants directly to businesses that help that business to get to the next stage of development. We've given larger grants to businesses that their work helps a whole supply chain and helps many um, smaller producers to access markets. And we've also, over the last couple of years, added, particularly for the low-grade wood market and the, and the dairy sector, larger grants that really can help with the, with the market itself for the sector. Um, but in addition to that, we have um, funded service provider organizations, and we've refined our strategy over the years for doing that, including partnering with statewide track record service providers who can have long-term relationships with businesses to help them meet their needs for learning and business assistance as they grow. And then also a category for smaller grants for innovative and pilot programs. Uh, for example, this year we're about to fund a, a program that works with networks of Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities to help reach farmers uh, from those communities. But in addition to that, we have done some research and development over the years, going back to our first um, fiscal year, when we got together to look at the strategy, we realized that as this program grows over time, more money might be moving through the program. And we wanted to look at the range of ways that we could deploy dollars. And one of the ways that we came up with uh, by analyzing capital gaps and opportunities was to partner with other financial institutions to enable them to get money to businesses in, in targeted ways. You're gonna hear from Sarah Isham from VITA shortly. Um, we partnered with them to do an organic transition loan program at a point in time where there were opportunities for organic dairies. Um, and when you look at the impact of those dollars, uh, it, it costs less than $3,000 of the public working lands dollars to retain a job in those farms. For every public dollar that we put into VITA, over $18 hit the ground helping a business. Um, and another example of one of the pilots that came out of our R&D work was the Sprout program that Vermont Community Loan Fund has, has, has offered. Um, in that case, uh, to create a job, it costs between five and $6,000 of working lands public dollars, and to retain a job, less than $4,000. For every working lands dollar that went into VCLF for the Sprout program, over $5 hit the ground to help a business. So I think that those, those are pretty, pretty um, impressive numbers in terms of impact and, and job creation. Looking at the data that I have available um, for the business grants that we've done over the years, uh, it, it costs less than $14,000 of public dollars to create one job. Um, so I think if you look at pro public programs, federal or state, that's a, that's a pretty good level of impact. Um, one of the ways that we do our work is, is through committees. Um, this Enterprise Financing Options Committee on this slide is, is one example of that. The committees are helpful in part because they bring together our three public sector agencies as well as our ex officio non-voting members, Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, the Housing and Conservation Board, and VITA, as well as the different private sector board members to bring their expertise involved. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there and, and, and move on to Mike. But I just wanted to say that, you know, Mike Snyder was with this program since, since the beginning. And, and we've had other folks like Sam Lincoln uh, from uh, Forest Parks and Recreation who've been great helps. But one of the things that's been a great joy for me serving with this program since it it's started has been to see the work that we've been able to do to support the forest sector and the forest economy. Um, we helped to get the, the forest viability program to get some of the good technical assistance that farms had been receiving for years. And we did the initial uh, systems analysis that led to the creation of the forest network that Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund has been serving as a backbone for. And the summits that the forest sector has had over the last couple of years have been a great opportunity to run into Mike in the hallway and just share how much that sector has developed in terms of the interrelationships among the businesses in the sector, the, the communication between the private and the public sector. So it's just been great to see that in action and how these strategic investments and, and community building has really had an effect um, within the, the forest and wood product sector. So with that, I wanna hand it off to Mike, who I believe you all know. Could I just quickly interrupt, Eric, this is, uh, is this on our website, our webpage? Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Thanks, Linda. All right, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Thanks, uh, uh, Madam Chair. And thank, uh, thank you all. Good morning. Thanks all for your interest uh, and for your ongoing support for the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. As some of you know, or have heard me say before, I like to say when we make, when Vermonters make their world-class 
food and forest products, they make Vermont, Vermont. And when we invest in them and their businesses, um, we invest in the best of Vermont. And so having been here, as Eric said, since the very beginning, um, I just want to note my appreciation. It's just so wonderful to see progress, um, collaboration and support um, across, you know, uh, the, the legislature and the administration and within the administration breaking down silos as Secretary Tebbett said. So it's a really great example and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here to help share in uh, celebrating that and, and the people who as Anson said, are the real stars of the show. Also, thank you, Eric, for your introduction. And if I could, uh, for your years of service, leadership, and many contributions, it's greatly appreciated. And if you'll indulge me one more, I'd like to also, it's important to thank our staff, um, uh, in particular, Matt Langless, our Essex Count, uh, Caledonia County Forester, who is our lead staff in support of our role here uh, and has served as my designee uh, when I'm not able and I greatly appreciate Matt's service uh, and uh, input. As well, I'd like to shout, give a shout out of appreciation to Sam Lincoln, former deputy commissioner uh, who left state service late this fall after nearly four years um, and during which he was just a great teammate and made many, many important contributions. So I um, wanna just give that shout out to Sam who recently left us. And finally, another a note of appreciation, I think on behalf of the whole board is that we continue to be grateful for the ongoing consistent philanthropic support from Ski Vermont using their fifth grade uh, passport program as a revenue stream. Ski Vermont's intentional focus on supporting uh, the Working Lands Enterprise Fund is, um, you know, $60,000, I think, to date. Uh, and it recognizes, I think it's a really nice example of the, the synergies and the overlap with our working lands and our recreation economy, that they're, they're uh, compatible and synergistic. And that's a really nice way to, to show that. And we appreciate that. So now a few comments focused on the re recent work of the board and staff in the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. Um, and let's see, Linda, if you could please move to slide four. This is slide four, great. Um, so the uh, additional fiscal 20 allocation that provided market level industry impact investments that added a mid-tier opportunity uh, with supply chain impact investments while continuing our traditional standard business grants. That's noted here on the slide in like uh, point two font, I think. So, um, but I've I've covered that for you there. Um, and Linda, if you could move us to slide five, please. I just wanted to highlight some of the investments in the forest economy shown here, uh, listed and shown. Uh, importantly, in a, in a range of categories, uh, a fiscal twenty investment from the Working Lands Fund, twenty thousand dollars to Leap. This is the logger education uh, to advance professionalism providing upgrades to their current website, allowing improved promotion and tracking of logger trainings, um, more timely certification uh, data for loggers and others seeking certified logging professionals. This is really important uh, for safety and a culture of professionalism in our logging sector and is a critical component to our recent modifications and improvements and reductions in workers' compensation insurance costs for this sector through professionalism and training. So that support has significant impact even at, a, um, at that level. Um, another example of the board's recent effort to scale up investments was a $150,000 grant to Rick Kesterson, the owner and operator of Rick's Firewood in Hyde Park to increase production capabilities and raw material storage and improving waste storage uh, in, a, in a kind of a key function there. So uh, pleased with that and proud of that kind of outcome. And another uh, type of investment has been in the Forest Business School, addressing a need that's been addressed among business owners who have, you'd say, mastered the production and day-to-day -day operations in their sawmill, for example, but want to make better decisions about business growth, investments, personnel, et cetera. So that's another way of supporting um, through that kind of business coaching and uh, assistance. As, as we've said before, so many of these working lands businesses are so busy working uh, in their business that it's difficult and challenging to work on their business. And this kind of investment helps them work on their businesses to make them better and more uh, productive, more competitive. Um, and so in, in my attempt to get us maybe close to on time, I'm gonna close there and turn it over to uh, introduce uh, Ted Brady, Deputy Secretary of Commerce and Community Development and ask Linda to advance the slides. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Commissioner Snyder. Hello, committee members, chair people. 
It's great to see all of you. Uh, Ted Brady from the Agency of Commerce here. Uh, I, I wanna first lead off by saying uh, what you've created here and what you've worked with ag and the team at ag to build has really created an economic engine and an economic assistance program that's unparalleled in state government. Uh, one, we recognize, it, it recognizes that the food, farm and forest economy is the economic engine of rural Vermont. Uh, and without uh, vibrant, successful businesses, uh, not only would our rural towns die, but the entire state would, would, would start to wither. And so it's our moral, our moral responsibility to invest the limited state resources we have in these rural places. And kudos to all of you for championing that cause. Uh, I also want to start off by saying COVID-19 has decimated the food, food, farm, and forest businesses as much as it decimated so many other sectors. When you think about restaurants that are closing, dis disturbing uh, the supply, the, the demand side of the equation for uh, farmers. When you think about retailers that are shuttering, supplying the demand side, uh, never mind the supply side of staffing and all these things that all of our farms and our loggers have had to go through. So I wanna tell the story about how your investment helped these businesses overcome and adapt to this crisis. And also how your investment helped Vermonters respond to an enormous disruption in the supply chain and redefine Vermonters relationship to food. So right when the crisis started, we the, uh, the board knew that we needed to do something to help these businesses. And obviously we didn't have the CRF money yet. We didn't have uh, a, a large influx of funding from the state yet. And so we redeployed $250,000. And if you look at the slide in front of you uh, now, this was the $250,000 of WeLab money that we redeployed to be responsive to COVID-19 related business needs. And we made 16 business grants and one service provider grant, and they're all listed on this sheet here. But these are things to try to help uh, cure some of those problems in the food supply chain going forward. This is meant to help businesses uh, grow instead of shrink through the crisis. And we managed to deploy uh, this money in a timely fashion. Now, as you all remember, back to the longest legislative session in the history, <laughs> uh, thanks to the CRF money, you folks were kind enough to appropriate us, not one, and when I say us, I mean the Working Lands Enterprise Board, not one, but two appropriations of CRF money. One was 2.5 million. If you could advance me to the next slide, please. One was $2.5 million to the Agency of Commerce to work with the WeLab uh, folks to make uh, some magic happen. Uh, and uh, that is represented, I believe, in the left-hand picture of Vermont, all the investments that were made with that $2.5 million. The agency simply executed a, a MOA with the WeLab, uh, with, with AG, I'm sorry, and we managed to put that money through the WeLab process and make $2.5 million worth of investments in uh, agriculture, food, forest, and wood products industries. Shortly after, in a separate bill, I believe in H966, I'm sorry, I, have, I think I might have these backwards. Yeah, in a, H961. Uh, in H961, I have them backwards. The H966, the one to the right is the 2.5 million. The one to the left is H961, which was another million dollars that you folks appropriated to WeLab and made investments uh, through the Agency of Agriculture's Greater COVID-19 Agriculture Assistance Program. So these were made and combined with the, the other ag assistance programs you put out there. All of this to say, thanks to you, the state had a body that was able to respond quickly, nimbly, and effectively to businesses that were struggling. As a reminder, the food, forest, and wood product sector you know, represents more than 80,000 people uh, who have jobs in this sector, which um, let's not forget that that's not 80,000 out of 600,000. That's 80,000 out of a workforce of about 300,000. So it's an enormous number. Uh, and Eric said it before, uh, but it's worth saying again, I really don't believe there's a more effective program out there for the cost that we invest for creating or saving a job and making some economic magic happen. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, another person that makes a lot of magic happen in the economic development world, which is uh, Ellen Kaler from the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. Good morning. Hi, nice to see you all. Um, I have been asked to share a little bit about the ex officio seats on the board. Um, as established in the Working Lands Enterprise Fund statute, there are three ex officio seats that do not rotate off the board and are not members of the administration. Uh, and they include uh, VIDA, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, of which I'm the executive director of. So today, together, we provide some consistency and some historical knowledge over time, as well as uh, really deep expertise in the working land sector as a whole. And we help uh, and assist the full board then as we consider strategic investments in the farm, food, wood, and forest products sectors. So it's important to know, however, and, and uh, Eric mentioned this in his remarks, that we are non-voting members. So while we can provide guidance and sector-specific information to the full board, we don't actually get to vote on any of the grants that the board makes. And we're okay with that. Uh, the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund was included um, as an ex officio member because in 2009, the legislature asked uh, my organization to create and manage the Farm to Plate Investment Program and for the purpose of writing the Farm to Plate Strategic Plan. So as soon, um, and with the soon uh, to be released Farm to Plate Plan 2.0, which many of you all are anxiously awaiting as we are awaiting giving it to you, um, this includes uh, 34 priority strategies and very informative briefs across an array of food system related product markets and issues. And the board then will have even more good intel and market information to help guide funding decisions in the years ahead. So the, the Farm to Place Strategic Plan provides uh, real foundational information that then helps guide the board in its decision making on the farm and food sector. In 2014, uh, as Mike mentioned, the board decided that the forest products industry would benefit from some kind of analysis or plan like the farm and food sector has had uh, to help guide its grant making in the forest related grant projects area. Uh, so the board appropriated $100,000 that year and tasked an, a newly created forestry committee uh, to hire a consultant and conduct a stakeholder engagement process and to develop an, an analysis of what the industry most needs. So that was completed in the spring of uh, 2019, the forest sector analysis, and it's been used as a guiding document by the board as it annually evaluates how to prioritize its investment strategy across the sector. So one of the recommendations that came out of that report uh, was uh, to develop a forest industry network and various value chain, forest value chain projects as a means of strengthening that industry. So much of this work is now being funded by WeLab through a contract with the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, along with other foundations and NBRC funding that uh, we're able to raise. And we're doing this all very much in high level coordination with all of the other stakeholder organizations that are supporting the industry. So that's a little bit of background of sort of the fact that there are these ex officio members on the board. And I wanna turn it over to, to Ella Chapin and Sarah Isham who also serve on in the, that capacity along with me on the board. And I should say, along with Eric, we are the longest serving board members. We've all been on since the very beginning days in, in 2012. Uh, so it's been uh, a real pleasure and a real honor to serve in this way. And I think we, um, have continued to make really, really smart investments in our working lands businesses. And um, I'm very grateful for all the support that you guys have all given over the years. So with that, Ella Chapin, please. Thank you, Ellen. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having us and spending this time talking about the wonderful outcomes of the Working Lands Enterprise Board over the years. Um, again, for the record, my name is Ella Chapin, and I run the Vermont Farm and Forest Viability Program at the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And um, soon to be moving on in March and to be succeeded by Liz Gleason, who some of you know, um, who's been working with me for 10 years on the program. Uh, so there'll be some good continuity there. 
in terms of VHCB's seat on the board, I just wanted to share a little bit um, of context around how sort of VHCB's role for the state managing the viability program and uh, business technical assistance through our network of business technical assistance providers. You know, it's been really pretty essential for WeLib and uh, the farm to plate work and the viability networks to really coordinate a lot of the business technical assistance. And it's been a role that uh, that I and we have played uh, on the uh, it, with WeLib over time. It's um, you know we the viability program manages state investments along with federal funds out to you know a network at this point of about eight to nine organizations that either work regionally or statewide providing in-depth business technical assistance to farm and forestry sector businesses. And you know, those nonprofit organizations are really focused on providing high quality services. Their staff is very much available and working immediately with producers. And so we end up sort of representing that work and funneling funds, state and federal funds to that network um, at sort of you know, these kinds of planning uh, levels statewide. So it's been great to be able to be a conduit of information between those organizations and the work of the WeLab board. Um, uh, I wanted to mention that since really the inception of the WeLab board, there's been, a, but there, in the early years of the board, there was very clear sentiment from, you know, sort of citizen members and ex officio members and other members of the board very early on that business technical assistance was a really important thing to invest in. And that even though we have as a state invested well in sort of the capital providers and the business technical assistance and production technical assistance providers that are out there. We have a great foundation. It's in fact, you know, the foundation set up in Vermont to help particularly the agricultural industry is the envy of most states across the nation in many ways, especially for supporting such a range of business types and scales. Um, so we have an exceptional foundation already when we led started, but there was there's always an ongoing need to further add capacity and and follow the developments in the ag and forestry industry as business types and business models change sometimes rapidly, like we're seeing right now. Um, so the WeLab board really very early on recognized that the majority of people that they were making in, in grants to really had been through one of these business technical assistance programs and we needed more of that work. I'd say also with the recent investments um, in uh, dairy grants and, and other grant programs to provide relief during the pandemic. I know the agency and we have all, you know, really the agency of ag staff and, and our viability teams have really noticed a clear need for even just basic record keeping with many businesses in order to access the relief programs at the state and federal levels that exist out there. So there's just an ongoing need to continue to uh, adapt our business and production technical assistance to the changing needs of the agricultural and forestry sectors. Um, I would want to note just the role that we let staff have played in uh, directing businesses that are applying for grants to different technical assistance providers and coordinating with our viability network and others. So, you know, knowing that while many businesses come in and receive grants, if they really have the foundation of a business plan and, and are really ready to access that capital, others get uh, sort of pointed in the direction of the viability program or other technical assistance providers, and then are able to come back and be at a better place with their business and ready to take on a new project and, and the capital that comes with that. So we've seen that routinely um, over the years. And uh, we love has made a lot of investments in business technical assistance, as you've already heard, including a $50,000 investment at the beginning of the pandemic, as, as folks talked about, about redeploying some of the we love assets 50,000 of that, as some of you know, came to the viability program to stand up a brand new sort of COVID recovery, rapid recovery uh, response program. And we served over 500 businesses over the course of the nine months of last sort of April through December. Um, uh, and that $50,000 investment at WeLab enabled that program to stand up and then was, was able to take advantage of the coronavirus relief funding that uh, you all approved for that program. Uh, for the second half of the calendar year. So I think I'll stop there. There is a need to really increase business technical assistance and other kinds of technical assistance that you'll see in the um, in the strategic plan that's coming to you in a few, you know, in a week or two from Ellen's shop and the Agency of Agriculture, uh, calling for many more people on the ground to be doing business and other types of technical assistance. 
and we are all looking for ways to continue to advance this and make the investments necessary to do so. And I am turning it over to Sarah Isham at VitaVac, who has been a longtime partner at WeLab as well as on the viability board. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Ella, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I am Sarah Isham. I'm the Director of Agricultural and Forestry Lending at Vermont Economic Development Authority, and I serve as the designee for CEO Cassie Palhima. Um, the Vermont Economic Development Authority, as an ex-official member of the WE Working Lands Enterprise Board, has allowed for partnering and leveraging opportunities. We also, we collaborate closely with the Vermont St Sustainable Jobs Fund and have referred many for farmers and forestry business operators to the Farm and Forest um, Viability Program. So there's a lot of synergies here. Vita's role in providing financing to farm and forest-based businesses to enhance Vermont's economy has allowed the Working Lands Enterprise Board and VITA to work collaboratively in identifying gaps, barriers, and opportunities for these industries. Working Lands Enterprise Initiative is unique because it invests in the businesses and organizations that are keystones to support our working lands economy. Without these organizations that are the key, without these enterprises and organizations, other businesses would not have the same access to markets or growth potential. Working Lands Enterprise Board consistently provides grants to businesses and from time to time philanthropically supports financial institutions to provide innovative financing tools that leverage public dollars to address system gaps and opportunities. In so doing, the Working Lands Enterprise Board complements the day-to-day -day work of Vermont lenders Providers. And we were fortunate to be able to, um, to benefit from this um, pilot program and provide the organic transition program, which you have seen on the slide. And um, I very much appreciate this um, working relationship that we have. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Secretary Tebbett. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all our uh, presenters. And um, now we wanna turn it over to some of the people that um, have really been on the ground and have been uh, recipients of, of grants in the past. And uh, we're gonna take you uh, through uh, uh, regions of Vermont, across the state of Vermont. We're gonna go to Brookfield. We're gonna scoot over to Granville and then up to Standard and then scoot over to East Hardwick and, and over to Pittsburgh. So um, I'm gonna introduce, um, um, someone that you're probably familiar with because you probably had some of their fantastic products. Uh, Judith Irvine uh, is the owner of Fat Toad Farm in Brookfield. Uh, and Judith, welcome and thank you for joining us uh, virtually here uh, with the legislature. And uh, why don't we begin, uh, Judith, why don't you talk about, just give us a little snapshot about your business and how maybe uh, this program has impacted you and how you've adapted uh, because of COVID-19. That might be a good, good way to uh, kick it off. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Judith. Sure, thank you. Um, I also wanted to um, just sincerely thank all the legislatures, legislators, and the state agency people here who have been working so hard to help all of us Vermonters get through the past year. And um, the work is not done, obviously, but uh, we all really appreciate it and feel very uh, comforted that you are on our team. Um, so Fat Toad Farm is the name of our business. This is a family owned business in Brookfield, Vermont. We make a goat's milk caramel. So the connection to the working lands of Vermont is that for the first eight years of our uh, existence, we ran a dairy goat farm, um, a dairy farm for goats. And then after that, we sold our goats to Ayersbrook Goat Dairy, which is in uh, downtown Randolph, uh, because we found running a specialty food business and a goat dairy was uh, getting too much. Uh, 
What happened as we went into 2019 is that we were doing 70% of our business with uh, specialty food stores all over the US and also including restaurants. And as we, um, as, as we know in 2020 rather, um, the rug was just 100% pulled out from underneath most of those businesses. And we were facing a major question like what is going to happen here with us? And we had our, always had a website presence, but we just had that as a, a relatively small component of our business. And we realized, well, okay, we're gonna have to pivot 100% and focus all of our energies and resources on that. Because as we all know, people rushed into the online marketplace and um, it just you know, blew up, both from a consumer point of view, but also from some of the stores point of view that they couldn't have people come through their doors, but they established their own online presence, presences. So one of the issues for us is that we had done our website and our Amazon presence just on our own, you know, just pulling it together as best we could, which was just not gonna cut it. So the, um, funds that we received from the Working Lands Enterprise Fund made it possible for us to contract with an actual professional organization, Lean Edge Marketing. And they helped us take a laser-like focus on our Amazon presence and our website in order to make it all more professional, to drive more people there, to capture more information, to do the analytics necessary to really understand what's happening in both those arenas and to prepare ourselves to not get drowned by the wave, but to ride the wave. And it made a gigantic difference for us. Um, our Amazon sales went up 110%. Our website sales went up 198%. And overall for our business, it made it so that instead of really potentially closing we increased our sales by 23% overall. So it made a huge amount of difference. And um, we were, it became, it has become so important for us that we will be continuing that work with Lean Edge Marketing as we go forward into this next year, because we're not done yet with this change in how everybody lives and works and buys um, in the pandemic world. And we need to still remain focused there. Thank you, Judith. And as you can see, and I think you'll hear other stories, uh, committee members, of how people have really pivoted and really had to change their whole business model uh, because of COVID. And we, we're grateful for the funds for the working lands that we've been able to help them do that. And you're going to see a lot uh, involved in e commerce and marketing and how to, because the markets were so uh, disruptive. Um, I, I'm going to, with your permission, Madam Chair, I've got to scoot off and, and hop on a, a, a news conference uh, with the governor, but I'm going to, uh, Lynn Allen Schmoller, who's our director of this program, has agreed to moderate the next members uh, that are going to tell their real life stories that's happening on the ground. And with your permission, I'm going to, I'm going to hop off and maybe I can hop off later if you're still going, but I've got to go for the governor and hopefully someone will ask me about the Working Lands Program so the uh, state of Vermont can hear more about it and how impactful it is. Uh, to the state of Vermont. And with your permission, uh, we'll turn it over to Lynn Allen Schmuller, our director. Thanks so much, Anson. Really appreciate you being here. And maybe we should have somebody here uh, make that phone call into you, into the governor. <laughs> okay. So, so thank <laughs> thanks. you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Lynn. Bye -bye. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Lynn Allen, for taking over. Thank you so much. Up next, I believe, is Gabby Tweet from Old Road Farm. Good morning, Gabby. Hi, um, I'm Gabby. Um, my partner Henry and I run Old Road Farm, a certified organic vegetable operation in Granville. Um, this past September, we closed on our property um, with the help of the Vermont, Vermont Land Trust. Um, and so we're going through a pretty big expansion. Um, we've seen over 100% increase in our revenue since um, 2019. Um, this past season, we had one full-time employee, and um, for 2021, we're looking to have two full-time employees and one part-time. Um, and we had a lot of um, business help with through the um, farm viability program. 
Um, so that has been crucial in our business development and expansion. Um, and as we continue to grow our business, um, we are ac accessing more markets and bringing larger volumes to these markets. So um, we decided to invest in a delivery van to help with um, this extra volume that we were bringing to market. And um, Working Lands Grant had um, approved our grant, which was great. And um, yeah, so we'll be doing that. Um, and we did have to do a little bit of a pivot shift this past season in our markets. Our farmer's market was canceled, but um, the demand for local food was still there. And we, so we decided to open up a CSA and we um, got a, you know, a, we received way more members than we thought we would. So we are continuing um, to expand our CSA and um, we had news that our farmer's market is going to be open for 2021 and we're going to continue our wholesale. So um, all of this has been super great and helpful in our business expansion. Thank you, Gabby. I wasn't sure if there were any questions yet or if we should just keep going. Why don't we keep going, Lynn Ellen, and, and we're almost to the end, and then people hopefully have noted their questions and we'll ask them. Thank you, sounds good. We're gonna welcome Reva Reynolds from Stannard Family Farm. Good morning, Reva. Reva, you're muted. Thank you, I just turned my video on and um, forgot to do the mute, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for inviting us today to share our stories and thank you so much for the grant funds that, that we have received. Um, I am part of Standard Farm. I married into this, I am a Seattle native. I came to UVM, met my husband and he grew up in the Northeast Kingdom on a fourth generation farm that used to do replacement heifers and sugaring and haying and a variety of things and, and now focuses on maple syrup. We are certified organic and we also do um, some grass fed beef mostly for our family and that's also certified organic. We received a grant uh, a couple of years ago from Working Lands Enterprise Initiative and also had support from the Farm and Forest Viability Program with business planning. And um, all of these things have been wonderful, but as everybody knows, this year was uh, unlike any other. We had experienced, especially with programming support, um, steady growth. We had record year in 2019 with sales and then um, March rolled around and suddenly my father-in-law did all of his sugaring by himself. My husband didn't go to help. We weren't sure what was safe, what wasn't. So that was, um, that was a hardship for our family to do that. And we're feeling much more prepared going into the 2021 season. We saw our sales completely dry up and we were projecting losses of over 20,000 in revenue for the year. With, um, with grant support and, and hard work, we ended up only coming in $8,000 under our um, revenue from the year before. So we were able to make up about $12,000 in revenue, which was really exciting and a big relief. And um, one of the ways in which we were able to do this with, with grant support was to focus more on wholesale orders. We had been doing a lot of restaurant orders and um, that piece dried up. We found um, a new customer that was interested in, in buying barrels direct from us. So we had to invest in the equipment to safely pack and strap pallets. We ended up building a small loading dock of sorts to be able to safely move these things into our pickup truck. And um, we also invested in a, a pallet jack so we could easily move pallets of things around and, and weigh them accurately. Um, we also had a restaurant customer um, they did their own creative pivot and ended up purchasing much higher volume to bring down their unit price, but they needed to get it in pallet form. So that was another customer we were grateful that we were able to, to pivot and become, you know, shippers of pallets pretty much. And um, despite being down $8,000 revenue from 2020 or from 2019, 
in 2020, we actually ended up selling three to 400 gallons more of maple syrup. So it's this interesting balance. We actually do have higher revenue when we sell retail, but we can move more syrup. And I think that the market is more consistent when we can build these wholesale relationships as well. So I feel so much better going into 2021. We're working towards a better balance, I think, of wholesale and retail customers that's more sustainable. And we're also in a better position to safely manage, um, we, we have started tapping, to safely manage tapping and sugaring this year. Thank you. Thanks, Reva. Um, if it's all right with folks, I just want to rewind back to Judith Irving, who just sent me a quick message that she wanted to add something. So Judith, would you like to unmute? Yes, thanks very much. Yes, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned um, we've been in business for 14 years and throughout that period of time, the farm viability program has been um, by our side the whole way. And it has made a big, big difference for us. The other thing I wanted to highlight was that we were privileged to uh, join the uh, Vermont Sustainable Job Fund group in 2018 as a, for a full year of support. And that morphed into being part of the cohort group that met throughout this past year. So that was a group that was managed by the Vermont Sustainable, Sustainable Jobs Fund. And it brought together in our group, six to eight of us who were basically struggling through the whole year trying to figure out what was happening, what was happening from a employee point of view, employer point of view, supply chain, uh, sales, you know, anything you can think of. And even as on a basic level of, um, supporting ourselves uh, to be able to keep going. And I wanted to really emphasize how important that was to all of us. In fact, we'll be continuing it this coming year, well, the year we're in, um, because we all found it a very important uh, mechanism for, for staying in touch and supporting each other. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. I'd like to welcome Ben Notterman from Snug Valley Farm. Morning, Ben. Hi, good morning. Thank you, thank you everybody for being here and thank you for having me. Uh, so we're Snug Valley Farm. We raise grass-fed and grass-finished beef as well as pasture-grown uh, pork. Uh, we're in East Hardwick. Um, it's, uh, we're a family operation. Uh, it's my wife and I, my folks, and um, our three-year-old son, if you could count him as farm help. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we are eternally grateful to uh, the support we've gotten through the Working Lands uh, Board and the initiatives that uh, have been out there. <clears throat> We've received two different grants from the Working Lands Board, one back in 2013 or 14 uh, to help us uh, get a delivery vehicle, um, a van to go to farmers markets. That was our primary mode of moving our product, which is at, uh, at that point was four or five farmers markets a week. Um, fast forward six years or so, and we, we started 2020 um, or ended 2019 doing a few farmers markets, looking to, to move more toward the wholesale market. Um, obviously March happened uh, or, or March March hit and COVID happened. Um, so we, we had to make some drastic pivots. We, we looked at our, our farmers, markets biz, farmers market business drying up overnight. Uh, our institutional sales, we supplied some colleges, schools, um, <clears throat> all that ended like a light switch going off. Um, and we, we were really, uh, forced to to uh, to think about how we're going to approach the next year and how do we uh, offset these these drastic changes. So um, waiting in the wings for the past year or so, we had an online website or uh, we have our our website, but we had an online store like almost ready to go live. It only took a global pandemic uh, to force us to put in the last six hours of work to put the store live and get things going. Um, so we were thinking about. Uh, how are we going to offset these sales? How are we going to keep our customers um, able to get our product uh, wherever they were in, in Northern Vermont? Um, we, at that point, we had been doing monthly meetups is what we were calling them, like drop point pickups. People would pre-order, we'd pick up, uh, put the order together, <clears throat> bring it to a certain spot. They would come meet us and take their product home. Uh, that We've been doing that for about the last five years to keep our farmer's market customers um, hooked on our products through the winter. So we didn't have to retrain them in the, in the summertime. Um, so we pivoted from that, like, oh, well, 
why don't we continue this, take it to the next level? Let's start home delivering this. So we launched the home delivery business second week in March or enterprise, I should say, uh, just to be safe, no contact. Um, my folks uh, are not spring chickens and we wanted, to, nobody knew anything at that point. So we wanted to protect everybody, have as little contact as possible with, with our customers, keep our customers safe and keep them confident in, their, in the supply chain that they were utilizing. So uh, we applied for a, one of the COVID response grants in, might've been May, I think. I don't remember quite, April, May. Um, that helped us purchase a uh, refrigerated delivery vehicle. Our product is all, fro is all frozen and also add um, a part-time uh, worker to both uh, fulfill orders, which we were packing anywhere between 40 and 50 orders a week at our busy point and also delivering two routes a week, one on the Route 100 corridor from Morrisville down to Warren Waitsfield, over to Barry Montpelier, and then back toward Hardwick, and then the other one in the greater Burlington area, um, you know, anywhere from Starksboro all the way up through Colchester and back on Route 15 toward, toward Hardwick. Um, so we applied for the grant, got the, the max, which was 25,000, invested in a refrigerated vehicle, added, uh, since getting that grant, we've added um, one full-time, worker at the farm, two part-time uh, workers who are are uh, packing orders and delivering orders on our two delivery days. And that that just has brought us like, we were in the dark, not knowing where we were gonna go. Uh, and it's kind of shown us the light, like this is the next, this is the next evolution of our, of our process here. Um, along the way, we have brought on, uh, oh, let's see, seven or eight partner farms. So we offer meat, being beef and pork, uh, but we thought, oh, there are lots of other farms of our, our farm friends of ours that were affected negatively by this COVID situation. Uh, so we partnered with farms like Sweet Round Farmstead out of uh, out of Albany, that's uh, cream top milk and cheese, Gebby's Maplehurst Farm in Greensboro, maple products, Patchwork Bakery and Farm in Hardwick being bred, Babette's Table, which is a high-end dried salami producer in uh, Waitsfield out of the Med River Food Hub, Pierce's Pastured Poultry, uh, whole fresh chickens from Albany, uh, the Lagus Farm sweet corn, Plowgate Creamery, also out of the Waitsfield based in area, high end cultured butter, and Henry's Hens, which is a pastured uh, egg operation here in Hardwick. So we're, we're essentially a rolling grocery store. So people are able, able to place an order on our website for all these products. So we're kind of a mini aggregator, like a, a true farm aggregator. Um, so all these farms were, were negatively hit by the COVID uh, issue or, or problems or pandemic, I should say. So we've kind of rising tide lifts all boats, brought them on in, in an effort to supply high quality food to, to our customer base and not just our products, but our, our farm, farm friends who are uh, hurt badly by this as well. Uh, we've been utilizing um, <clears throat> the farm viability services. I would say, I'd have to check back, but it's been eight or 10 years we've been uh, using business coaching uh, analysis on and off, depending on if we're making any big moves uh, going forward, we you know bring them on to help us uh, determine if this was a good idea or not. Um, and it, one of the other questions that Anson or Linellen would be asking is, do we uh, do we touch any other uh, working lands um, grant recipients? And I just went down the list. There's eight different recipients that we work very closely with. Anywhere from the anybody from the like the Food Venture Center in Hardwick to Sweet Round Farm, Pete's Greens, uh, Meeting Place Pastures down in Cornwall, the Wind Farm, Maple Wind Farm, Plowgate Creamery. The, I mean, I, I didn't even realize that we were touching that many, and uh, that was that was kind of an eye opener. So the Working Lands Initiative has helped not just us, but you know, partner farms that I didn't even realize had been helped. So um, we're eternally grateful for that and all the help that it's provided. It's, I think it is one of the best. Um, grant programs out there to lift like the rising time to lift the, the agriculture and forestry sectors, um, no doubt. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much for sharing all of that, Ben. I believe we only have one more business on the line. I'm not sure if Adam Hausman from Adams Berry Farm was able to join us, but we do have Ken Gagnon from Gagnon Lumber here this morning. Good morning, Ken. Well, good morning, everyone. I see some familiar faces and some new ones, and uh, I'm glad you invited me. Um, I guess a quick uh, up to speed is uh, we're, we uh, operate a family sawmill, 
but which uh, in, started out with my dad in uh, some 60 odd years ago. And I had the, uh, how you say the, however the thing you want to call it was born into it, spent the first 18 years of my life wishing that I could do something else and came back at it. And uh, here it is 40 years later and uh, I'm doing it. And uh, so we uh, operate a, a hardwood, we're kind of a, we're, for the lack of terminology, we're kind of a hybrid sawmill, not so much about virtual and people, but uh, it's the kind of wood we saw. We, we started out sawing uh, primarily softwoods through my first 10 years and dealing locally pretty much uh, the first 10 years. And then in 1990, we uh, built a new mill on the same farm. We're on a family farm that was uh, been in Pittsford, uh, my great grandfather bought it in 1880. Uh, did uh, had a dairy here up until the uh, early 60s. My dad was trying to juggle two balls and decided, hey, he was going to go with the wood and let the so it basically transitioned to a full time sawmill. And that morphed into him becoming a more of a trucker. I came on in uh, 1980 and uh, 90, in 1990 we decided to upscale and built a, a new mill and uh, at that point we started uh, we picked up and ran uh, more hardwood for wholesale industry so we developed the last 25 or so years with a with our how you say our meat and potatoes has been wholesale hardwoods and then the remainder has been softwoods with uh, both retail and wholesale um, I'd say overall, we have 10, 10 folks that work with us, my father, myself, uh, my wife, and then um, I got a crew of seven. And uh, this year definitely was a, a bit of a bumpy ride to start out with. Um, we, uh, the, the lumber market really took a, took a pause there in uh, March. A lot of the, the main wholesalers and well, a lot of the companies we dealt with uh, in Canada basically stopped trucking for quite a while. Um, that was a pretty big shock. And, uh, but interestingly enough, the retail side, the side with uh, the softwood side picked up and uh, overall uh, we've been able to keep everybody on 100% of the time and uh, have, uh, you know, worked our way through, uh, worked our way through dealing with customers in a much different way. We we've done what they call curbside pickup. You call in your order and put it together, uh, and we've minimized as much uh, close contact and and uh, have been fortunate. Um, so overall, uh, we've had a, a 2020 was a, was an okay year. Uh, definitely would like to do something a little different uh, with the stress levels for 2021, but we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, 2019 uh, was the year that we uh, were fortunate to get a uh, an infrastructure grant uh, to bring in three phase electricity to our mill. That's been a big. That's been a if you want to liken it to something, it's kind of like liking it to rural electrification that happened in this state back in the 20s or whatever. We we ran generate we ran generators diesels since uh, 58 all the way up till uh, just a little better than a year ago. And so the heavy lift, the the three phase power for running our equipment was all run by diesel, and we could see that that was. Uh, getting to be more challenging, uh, not only with the price of fuel fluctuating the way it does, uh, but also uh, a number of other ways that was going to make it more difficult for us to stay competitive. So uh, we put in an application, like I said, in uh, the end of uh, 19, uh, 2018, it came through in uh, 2019. And uh, worked with uh, the WeLab folks, uh, found favor with us to help us put this through. It was a big project. Um, the, the sticker price on this whole thing came in at $380,000, which was you know, totally beyond anything we could swing uh, to justify. Um, it turned out that with uh, the, uh, the grant 
from the Wee Lab, and then Green Mountain Power kicked in, and basically uh, we picked up the the remainder, which turned out to be about forty five to fifty percent, and uh, we we swung it, and uh, it was it was it's so that now there's a one point six miles of three phase power that runs from Route Seven uh, right down. Uh, uh, two roads and right to our mill, which is uh, something that took a little getting used to. It was quite a big deal. It was a big deal. And so we, uh, that took, it was uh, basically December of a year ago, December of 2019, when we flipped the switch and uh, have been running with that diesel, uh, without the diesel since then. And uh, it's definitely made a, a much it's been a very welcome, uh, how you say, change from, from going that route. It's definitely opened a number of doors. We, uh, it's allowed us to be able to uh, put on some other equipment. We've just added a, um, a four-sided planer. Actually, it's got seven heads, seven motors on it. And um, it would have been something that we uh, had been dreaming about uh, for a number for, for a long time, and we made that happen this past fall. So we have a, a planer matcher now that can do uh, up to 15 inches wide and up to eight inches thick, and uh, primarily doing uh, molding and patterns such as uh, V group paneling and that sort of thing. Um, so that's been a big step. And the other big step that I've dreamed about and. and that's really how this project has helped get us to is we we made a, um, uh, uh, a, a commitment with Catamount Solar and we're putting uh, an 85 kW solar array system on our mill roof and um, they're starting to install that that requires a three phase connection so that will feed power we're going to end up with a net metering program that'll get pretty near 70% of the of the electricity that we use now is going to be uh, coming off our roof. So that's, in my mind, uh, you know, it's like I I tell people it's like I bought another generator and then I bought the diesel with it, but it's not diesel. I bought the sun to go with it. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, so anyway, I I, I think uh, without that we lab program, it would be a much bigger different picture for us. Here at uh, our mill, I think uh, we'd be fighting a, uh, an uphill battle to stay in this game. Um, and, uh, you know, for me going forward, I've got a crew that are that have been with me shoot, 20 years or more. I've got some guys that have been with me and, um, you know, the future looks pretty solid. We're looking forward to it. And uh, my dad. He's also a driving force, <laughs> and I mean driving. <laughs> he's uh, 84, and uh, he is the he's the delivery guy, and uh, uh, you know he, he's he's been real supportive about it. I thought he would be a little uh, reluctant about the solar thing, but he's pretty cool about that, and so uh, uh, we're looking forward uh, to seeing that come on. Uh, touching base with other businesses that we connect with. We are, we're, we're networked with more, more uh, land work escape, uh, uh, working lands folks than I realized we work with uh, a number of other sawmills. Uh, right now we're helping out uh, collaborating with Sear Lumber up in uh, Milton, Vermont. They had a catastrophe, uh, catastrophe. They burnt, their mill burnt in November and uh, they still kept their kiln and planer operations. And so they reached out to us and we're, uh, sawing uh, eastern white pine and uh, they're taking it up and they they bring the stickers down we're sawing it putting the lumber on stickers and they're keeping their guys going up there um, so that's been a good thing it's also making it challenging to keep enough logs coming in uh, it's been a little different kind of flow but uh, we're, we're 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 happy about that uh, other other places we deal with are there's uh, <clears throat> the stone farm over in Orwell as a, a turkey farmer that we supply pretty much uh, a big part of their bedding. Uh, we work with uh, Champlain Orchards up in uh, uh, gosh I'm Shoreham and uh, Sunrise Orchards also up in the Shoreham with their use for uh, apple box materials. Um, so. I guess, uh, and then the other thing that we've been uh, a part of is we supply wood chips for fuel 
for um, uh, two schools in Bennington, Mount Anthony Union High School and Mount Anthony Middle School. We've also supplied to Middlebury College and also Green Mountain College and hopefully uh, Green Mountain, we're looking forward to them coming back online, hopefully this upcoming year. So I've uh, burned up enough time. Thank you. Ken, thank you so much for being here. And I just, it, of particular note, this FY19 grant was an industry impact grant and was just an example of some of the scaling up that the board strategically wanted to do. And I'm gonna try not to hold it against Ken for not inviting Dave Hubbard and I back when he flipped the switch because we did go down and visit him prior, but um, I'm trying to get over it. So I see that Adam is here. Good morning. I'm really excited that Adam is here from Adams Berry Farm. Hi, and good Take it away. Hi, um, Adam Hausman from Adams Berry Farm in Charlotte. Um, we received a supply chain grant um, in 2020, um, and the project was uh, to expand our production and uh, some of our efficiencies, and then also work on um, kind of developing uh, a broader um, both aggregation um, system, uh, co-packing system, um, along with more consulting and, and education um, within uh, both Vermont and kind of the greater region. Um, so initially, as of this year, I mean, obviously it was a, a strange year, um, but we um, did most of the site work and planted, um, all in all, we put in about um, 7,000 new uh, blueberry bushes this year. Um, and that um, will um, increase our, our gross sales by about $200,000. Um, huge input um, for, for, for as energy getting it established, but then uh, the long-term benefits, um, uh, blueberry plants last about 50 years. So our um, kind of impact within the market will be, um, will be broad and long lasting. Um, it has some other um, wonderful benefits and that we've been trying to shift our business to be more of a, um, a year round business. Um, we've kind of, as, our business has matured. This is, uh, I think, coming into our 20th year this year. We really struggled with um, kind of the seasonality of our business. And so with this expansion, we're freezing more and more and uh, and uh, developing more of a, a year-round presence within the marketplace and distribution. And this will allow us to uh, employ people uh, throughout the year as well. So we're really excited about that as far as um, the commitment to employees, but also the stability of the workforce, uh, stability of the farm and business as well. So, um, um, trying to think of what else to share about other than that, we, as far as the blueberry investment, we also invested in um, packing equipment and sorting equipment. And a lot of that has to do with increasing both the efficiencies of our own business, but also, um, also the quality. And then um, uh, our goal is to be able to kind of create a, a model that can be replicated through other growers, um, which is it's common in other parts of the country in the in other berry growing regions. But um, in Vermont, it's not the the scale of a lot of the growers and is, is much smaller. Um, and so we're trying to create more of a, rep, uh, a model that can be replicated by other growers to be able to help them scale up and help uh, Vermont farmers reach a broader audience and have a broader reach than just the immediate um, kind of hyper localized what I call the hyper localized market that we all work with um, that'll allow us to team up together and uh, push broader you know into other parts of New England and really hopefully open up uh, new markets and new revenue streams for farms and and stability for other farms in the future as well so um, what else um, I guess as far as um, as far as other um, details about the project, we're now, we've kind of come to the end of the first season of implementation. And now our winter is being spent um, working on kind of consulting materials, which we've been teaming up with um, Sam Smith from the Intervale Center on developing um, materials right now. And Sam also actually helped us out with uh, business planning and kind of farm viability work and making sure that the project was realistic before we launched it and pitched it as well. Um, 
but we've been working on that. We've been kind of fine tuning some of our food safety work and um, our, our packing line and packing system so that it's efficient for both us and, um, and in theory, as we um, invite other, other growers to use it or co-pack for them, that it can easily handle that flow and increase flow that we're, we're hoping to develop over time. Um, our project is, it's a, um, it's kind of a long-term project because I'm, because of perennials, uh, perennials take a long time to get established. So we've put them in the ground. Um, there's a, a lot of preliminary work that has happened right now. And now it's, we're, we're entering kind of the maturity phase and gr growing to maturity. And so the results will be seen long-term for us, but it will, um, it, the, the impact should be should be tremendous over over the period. So, um, so we're we're really excited for um, the opportunity. This is our actually second um, time that we've uh, been through the Working Lands program, as far as uh, a, a grant recipient. And um, each time, it's launched our business into kind of the next level, the next scale, um, and enabled us to um, really broaden our our reach and have uh, have a just tremendous impact on the local food system, and so we're we're just feeling so fortunate that we're part of this and able to be um, to, to, to able to kind of launch our business and our farm into the into you know the next ten years as well. So um, so thank you for everyone's support on that. Thank you so much, Adam. Before I start to ask about popsicles, I really need to ask Madam Chair, I'm looking at the time here. Would you like mm -hmm. to shift to questions? Adam and I collaborated on a popsicle years ago, so we'll, we'll talk about that offline. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that would be great. If folks have questions uh, for the committee members who know how to raise their blue hands, that would be great. If Bobby, if you see, uh, Bobby, I see your finger up, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, um, I have, you know, we've had some hearings. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank all the participants for showing up and taking part in, in this today because, you know, it's great hearing from the farmers and people that have received uh, grants from the program that we set up many years ago. Um, but getting back to uh, questions, um, We've had hearings already, uh, you know, about other issues, and <clears throat> the issue of labor keeps coming up. Um, and I think that from what we've already heard, uh, the labor issue is the biggest issue facing a lot of our, our people in, in the ag business. And I'm wondering, have any of you had labor problems and um, have you tried to uh, access the H2A program to get employees that way um, to cover your labor issues if you had any? I can speak to that. Um... We, uh, we have a pretty laborious crop as far as harvesting berries and continual harvest um, as well. And labor has always been a challenge for us. Um, and um, four years ago, we entered the H2A program and started working with a, a group of um, uh, well, brothers and friends from Guatemala. And it, so it's part of our crew. Um, it's not f our full crew, but it uh, has made a huge difference in the stability of our business. Um, and that, first of all, they're truly professionals that want to be here and farm and work. Um, but it's also that um, that annual um, the, they return every year and have created an annual stability. And so instead of spending uh, a good portion of your season uh, training people and getting them up to speed. Um, we have a group that comes back and um, hits the ground running and now is very self-sufficient and it's, it's allowed us to grow in a different way. Um, the program's cumbersome, it's expensive, um, and there's definitely challenges around that. Um, um, and I think they, you know, they brought up 
they're brought up often, um, but uh, never fully addressed. But um, but it, the H2A program is great. I think also seeing businesses try to become year-round businesses is helping employ uh, local individuals as well, and keeping that just stability in the workplace. In the workplace, yep. is big. Yep. Thank thank you. Surely. Does anybody else want to comment on the labor issue? Any of our farmers in particular? I'm seeing Ben, ben Notterman nodding his head. Uh, yeah, so labor has been a, a, a big challenge for us. Um, so when, when COVID hit, uh, we were kind of running a bare bones operation, just pretty much myself doing everything and my folks helping out when they could. Um, so the two part-time uh, equivalents or part-time employees that we hired for our fulfillment and delivery system were both out of work uh, folks due to COVID. One, a restaurant manager whose restaurant closed permanently. The other, the other is a uh, performing artist who is... I'm hearing some background noise. Yeah, I could make, and people make sure they're muted unless they're speaking. Thanks. Um, sorry about that. I don't know if it was... Now you've muted yourself. Yeah, there <laughs> okay. you go, Ben. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, so, so the two the two part timers were out of work folks due to COVID. One a performing artist and one a chef and restaurant manager whose restaurant closed. Um, so they were they were uh, very happy to come on and 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 work part time for us. The full time that we have hired took us a long time to find. Um, we were looking for somebody who just wasn't a grunt farmer or farm worker. We were looking for somebody who's interested in regener regenerative ag that we practice. Uh, that we could train in our grazing system and really has like longevity in the position, not just a worker. Um, and we actually found him through Instagram or he found us through Instagram and we hired him. He was at a, at a farm in Pennsylvania uh, and we hired him and he started December 1st uh, and it's been a huge help. We have, we also have a part-time high school student who's been with us for pushing three years now doing, doing chores, uh, light chores that a high school guy could, could handle. And we're always we're always trying and looking for for more folks, but it it was a very hard market to hire in, even though a lot of people were out of work. But uh, I think we got very lucky, uh, and I'm very happy with the crew we have. Carolyn, you'd sound better if we could hear you. Yeah, I know the. Uh, I was pushing my oh, space. You were my on. space. My space bar was not working, Bobby. Um, well, you were actually better on mute. Oh, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, so I see. Uh, I see a hand up. Uh, Paul Martin, Representative Paul Martin, has a question. Uh, but before we go to Paul, I'm wondering if there's any other person, any of our other guests, who would like to comment on the labor issue. I'm not seeing anybody waving. Oh, speak just, up, great. Reva, yeah, thank you. Uh, with, with sugaring, it is like berry picking, very seasonal. And I think that a lot of larger organizations have done good work trying to create something year round for their employees. So part of the year they are tapping, part of the year they're doing something else. But we've always struggled a little bit with wanting to stay at a family scale because we are concerned about you know, the temporary labor, part-time labor. Um, we did with the Working Lands Grant a couple years ago, 2018, um, we did actually hire in people for part-time and we had two people helping in various ways. And I just found that all of the work that I had to do quarterly to file taxes, the workman's comp that I needed to have and keep um, up to date and file reports in and of themselves, none of them took a lot of time, but it just was one more thing to keep track of and it became easier to simply become more efficient or dial back or just not do as much social media marketing, for example. Um, so yeah, I, I think labor continues to play constraints in a lot of family farms, especially when it's very seasonal. And I'd never considered H2A for the tapping and sugaring time of year, um, especially with, with sugaring, it's so weather dependent. It's not like you can say, okay, we need you for six straight weeks every day. There might be three weeks where the weather's wrong and you just, you're like, okay, we don't need you. And then you end up calling somebody being like, okay, we need you for like the next 48 hours, pretty much for 48 hours. And you can sleep six hours a night. It's, it's, it's tricky. I think it's one of the reasons why sugaring 
tends to be either really large scale where you do hire a workforce that does other things around the year, or it tends to be very family. Where Are there other questions? Um, yeah, please go ahead. Members? Well, wait a minute, Bobby. I, I, I'm wondering if we had the, um, it, has everybody weighed in regarding labor that wants to, and then Paul Martin has his hand up. I'm not seeing anybody else. Um, Paul, why don't you go ahead? Sure, I, I'll try to keep it pretty quick. Um, you can, you know, just in respect out of time, because I know we're running out of time. But um, the timing was right in a constituent reaching out to me this morning uh, with an issue regarding uh, meat processing availability. And I stepped away from the computer for five minutes earlier. Maybe it was brought up during those five minutes, um, uh, but I don't think it was. <clears throat> I'm just wondering what, uh, you, you know, maybe, maybe Lynn Allen could comment on this or, uh, you know, I know that the governor had just allocated a lot of funds in the budget for um, this issue and VT Digger did an article about it. Uh, earlier today that Representative Lisa Hango shared with me after uh, we had answered the constituent. Um, and it also brought to light, uh, it, about a week and a half ago, I purchased milk from a local dairy and also purchased some beef out of their freezer and noticed that it was processed in New Hampshire. So I'm wondering, um, you know, if there is any initiative in getting or incentivizing more meat processing facilities in the state, um, through the you know the working lands program or anything like that um, that might make this issue go away a little bit or make it a little easier for for farmers to process um, beef maybe Ben may have some comments on this as well uh, you know regarding processing or things like that our constituent also mentioned the desire to maybe process on farm and I know there's a lot of controversy around that health safety things like that but I, I'm just wondering if there's any commentary on this issue and just to also add, I appreciate everybody's uh, uh, testimony today. It was really nice to hear from everybody. It was nice to be on this hearing and I, I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. thank you for your question, Representative Martin. And I, I understand Secretary Tebbets has now left the call. I know that Ellen Kaler is on the call and I know that Ellen is doing some direct work. I don't think there's a better person to speak to this in terms of the experience um, than the owner operator, Ben Notterman from Sug Valley. So I, I will push that to him. It is a priority um, of the agency, but let's hear from Ben on this first. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we actually use uh, four different slaughter facilities, depending on our, our chain or our, our, the product chain, wherever it's headed. Um, we use one state inspected facility in Troy, which is Bro's Meat Market. We use Northeast Kingdom. Uh, which is a USDA facility in St. J. Lindenville. PT Farm, which is uh, just across the river in North Haverhill, New Hampshire. That might be the, uh, the New Hampshire plant uh, you, you saw in the package, uh, Representative Martin. But, um, and then we also use uh, occasionally the Royal Butcher and Randolph. Um, slaughter is a challenge and it was a big challenge this starting in March when, when there was a lack of things on grocery store shelves uh, local producers, we tried to ramp up, but there are only so many spots. Um, in a business that we plan ahead so far, we've already booked like typically a year out. Uh, right now I have all of 21 and 22 booked because I don't want to be caught short on slaughter spots uh, and processing spots. So uh, it's definitely a challenge. Um, and there were a lot of people trying to jump into the, in, into the meat game during this, this pandemic, which made it hard for us who are like make our livelihood with, with steady supply, they were taking, trying to see, well, not steal, but they were using the spots that we had been counting on that weren't maybe 100% signed up for, but kind of had a rolling understanding, or understanding with the processors. So it was a real challenge. And, and we, were, we were fighting for all of our slaughter spots um, up until about November when we were slated again. <clears throat> we were able to sign up going forward for the next year or two. Um, there's definitely a need for more slaughtering. I don't know of any working land stuff that's coming down the the pike, but there is definitely a need. Did Ellen want to respond to, as well? I see Chris Pearson's hand is up and Bobby. Uh, Ellen, do you want to go ahead and respond? I, I think Ben covered it really well. I think the board and the agency and uh, the Farm to Plate Network is very much interested in this topic and figuring out how do we support 
getting more infrastructure, uh, more processing facilities online over the next year or two. Um, as you know, uh, standing up a, a significant scale of, of meat sl uh, slaughter and processing facilities is a several million dollar uh, effort that requires a lot of permitting. And, uh, and so it's not a quick overnight kind of thing. And during COVID, as Ben mentioned, um, you know, we, we needed things to be ready to go overnight because of consumer demand uh, and the needs of producers. So um, we have, a, I think, a fairly coordinated, well uh, planned out uh, approach going forward. Uh, funding is going to be a, a critical part. So we're very pleased that the governor uh, mentioned that in his, in his budget yesterday. Great. Um, so, Bobby, do you have something you want to follow up with? I see Chris has his well, hand up. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we've, we've talked quite a bit about that in the Senate and had people in. And of course, um, last fall, before we had that December 31 cutoff for culvert funds, um, we, had, we had worked with the Secretary of Ag in regards to uh, meat processing. And uh, Abby Willard from the agency um, and her crew had done an in-depth review of all the slaughter facilities, and but it was late in the in the fall, and we tried we had to turn our money back in on a certain date to the administration from AG, and. Um, we tried to get some money to uh, push out to the slaughter facilities to advance um, and do upgrades and buy equipment to add to their uh, structures to help with this. Um, and, and we were too late actually in doing this. And, but I would expect during this season, uh, we will be putting, and I'm sure Anson you know, and the agency of ag will be recommending putting money into the meat processing a business to help out, hopefully for this fall at least. And the other issue uh, that I just want to say is that, you know, really we only have uh, Booth Brothers uh, processing of milk and Monument Farms where we're very uh, short on milk processing in the state. So that's why you might see milk in Vermont bottled from an out-of-state uh, out processor. Um, and I'll let Chris jump in. Uh, thank you. I, I've been thinking as we think about the meat processing, and so I guess this is a question for Ellen or Lynn Allen, or anybody, um, has there ever been a, a, an attempt or, or should we think of an attempt for a meat processing uh, slaughterhouse cooperative? I, I mean, there, there's, we hear this from pretty well all meat producers. And, and so the, the demand is, is there and we seem to hope that someone will come along with a business plan. But I, I guess I've wondered if anyone's considered that way, it might be an interesting way to raise the capital as well. So I'm just curious if that idea has been uh, explored at all. Ellen, I see you're unmuted. Do you want to try to take a yeah, stab at it's, it? Um, it? Yes, thank you. It's a, it's a great question. Um, uh, my general sense is that uh, going for a more formal cooperative legal structure is not something that a lot of producers do. It involves a lot of meeting and there's a lot of cost. However, uh, there are discussions uh, underway about more of taking an aggregation approach of multiple producers coming together, having some similar standards, being able to have a brand that they can sell under um, as a way of moving more product um, uh, from the producer side of things. Um, but was your question about the, the processing facilities themselves and the relationship between the processors and the producers? Yeah, I mean, we, we clearly we understand. I, I, I've not met a uh, meat uh, a farmer that's trying to raise meat, say anything other than it's really hard to get slaughtered. And uh, so the demand is there. We, you know, uh, I'm not a, uh, I don't have a crystal ball, but I would guess that in the next 
20 years, the demand for high quality local meats is not going down. And so it just, it, I, I guess I just wonder uh, rather than, than all the work hoping to lure somebody uh, to the business that if there's a way to stand it up ourselves. Yeah, and, and one example of, of just that actually was a Working Lands grant of uh, 20,000 that was made in May to Justin Sourwain, who's the new owner of Royal Butcher in Randolph. And part, and he's a beef uh, grower, he's a grass-fed beef raiser. And one of the reasons why he wanted to buy Royal Butcher uh, was so that he could have guaranteed slots. So he has about half of the slots are, are his animals. Um, so uh, the, we were able, the Working Lands Board gave him a grant to inc increase the amount of equipment so that he could have greater throughput, especially on ground meat going through. But I think, you know, you, the same thing has happened with, um, with uh, the packing house, uh, Vermont Packing House down in, in Springfield, where uh, another entity has bought up about 40% of the of the slots uh, with for their own animals, which is an aggregated, you know, a group of farmers that are aggregated to get those slots. So it, it it's not in a cooperative model, but it's starting to happen in some places. And I think the big question is that you're raising is can it be replicated, expanded upon? Is that a model that we could get? other farmers and slaughter facilities to go in on together. So it's a great question. Um, I'll bring it to uh, the folks that I know that are working on these questions and see if, if it has any, uh, any, any um, get some traction. Thanks. Thanks, Chris, great question. Anybody else have a question at this point uh, for any of our guests? John O'Brien. Thank you, Carolyn. And I don't know, uh, maybe Lynn Allen or Ellen can, can kick this to somebody else, but, uh, and, and it's sort of a follow-up to what, what we've just talked about was that I'm wondering, like there, there are more applications than you have money for. And, and so in some ways I can see this working lands being reactive to those, you're, you're weighing them, you know, with a number of factors, but I wondered if if you ever think of being proactive too and thinking like, okay, meat processing is a huge bottleneck. So if we solve that problem, there's a multiplier effect or in hemp, there's a certain bottleneck right here at, you know, at, at drying or processing or, or you know, in, in the forest economy, there's a bottleneck right here. So do you, do you work with the agencies to identify those bottlenecks and then think those are, those are that should be the number one grants we give out or go after them in that way. It looks like Eric DeLuca wants to speak to us, our vice chair, and, and Ellen certainly could too. But I, yes, there's absolutely, and I, I used the word decisive earlier, but there's absolutely intention behind the way the requests for applications or the requests for proposals are developed. But I'll let Eric speak to this in the interest of time. Eric, do you wanna uh, go ahead? And then Rodney Graham has a question too. And Eric, if you could just even speak to the FY21 application if you'd like to. Um, well, just in the interest of brevity, um, the, the point that I wanted to make is that this question of um, doing analysis and targeting sectors and, and, and allocating funding to, to strategic sectors that we've identified, um, balanced with um, seeing what the businesses are experiencing and, um, and planning and bringing forward, that balance is something that's been front of mind for the program throughout its history. Um, and there has over time been a cultural bias to really see what the businesses have to say and what they're working with. And um, we try, as Lynn Ellen mentioned, with our requests for applications to identify areas of, of strategic relevance that we've identified, but then also give the businesses the opportunity to, um, to flag what they see as, op as, as chances to, to bring things forward. We have seen with the uh, low-grade meat with uh, some of the, the, the dairy situations over time. There have been instances where we have noticed particular market development or supply chain development opportunities and, and targeted them with the way we design the funds. So we do it in both directions, but we do give a lot of credence to what the businesses are seeing on the ground and how they, mm. how they bring things forward. Thanks, Eric. Um, Rodney, do you wanna, comment or have a question? 
I have a question, and it's just a broad question. Um, if if someone was to if someone was contemplating um, starting a slaughter facility, what would be the recommendation on where to start? Uh, business plan, moving on. I mean, I you know just. I'm what seeing a lot of head shaking, yes. <laughs> it's, it's a great question. I mean, I think there's just a number of different stakeholders that you need to engage in this. And I think, you know, we did hear from Forest and Farm Viability, Ella Shop, we heard from Vita, we heard from Ellen. I think that um, it does start with business planning, but I think you have to engage the resources that you know are at hand. And that's something that we do in the Agricultural Development Division every day, um, because, we could just get a, a grantee who knows someone else who received funds and they're thinking, well, this is how I could help my business. And so I might get an email any day and I'm constantly just connecting that person to resources. So, I mean, I think it depends on who it is, but it's really just about asking the question and figuring mm -hmm. out who can help you, the stakeholders mm -hmm. that help get your business up and running. Does that help you, Representative Graham? I'm also seeing a chat from Abby Willard yeah. and she says, she says, reach out to the agency of yeah. Ag Meat Inspection Division as they offer a tremendous amount of technical assistance and site visits to support new and expanding facilities. So thanks Abby for shouting out here. Uh, any other questions that anyone has? Yeah, Carolyn, I have one. Yes, uh, okay. And it's, uh, well, we could stay on most of the day, I think. But anyways, um, you know, we've gone around around the circle pretty well here and hearing from everyone. Um, I'm wondering, uh, with the participants uh, other than us as legislators, uh, for you other participants, what uh, is there anything that we could do that would help make your life better in the ag field or the sawmill field? Um, is there anything hanging out there that we should be looking at? Because we really didn't get too many pointers on what we could do um, other than supply money to help the Working Lands Enterprise um, program. Anyone with a hand up or? That's good news. Well, I would, <laughs> I, I would just like to encourage thinking about site visits and um, <clears throat> wherever you are in your county, visiting your farmer, thinking about the producer or the forestry operations and connecting with those businesses that are really the drivers of all we're talking about. I mean, I think that making those connections were a small state um, are just really important and you'll learn so much about what the needs are directly. So that's just one tactic that I can think of in terms of you all as representatives. I know one of my would, favorite things that we've done over the years is actually go to do site visits. That's been, yeah, I, I love that. Good. I mean, I, I, I have a farm of my own, but it's always good to see what other people are doing. Eric, were you going to comment? I, I was just going to add that Ellen mentioned that the, the, um, the Ag Strategic Plan is hitting the ground quite soon with uh, Farm to Plate and the Agency of Agriculture collaborating on that. And we try to make an effort, not in our, in our, only in our own work to align with and be aware of the priority strategies that come through resources like that, but we also encourage applicants, uh, businesses or business assistance programs to align themselves with um, strategies that are identified through plans like that and the ongoing work of the forest network that builds on the forest systems analysis for specific value chains that represent opportunities. That's another touchstone we use and that's a nice reference for you as well. And I see Judith's hand is up. Judith, you wanna go ahead? Yes, I did. I wanted to mention that I think that the <clears throat> this whole WLEF grant um, network and system is very well managed and very easy to participate in from a farmer slash producer point of view. And I think that's really important because as people have referenced, um, 
most of us did not get into the business we're in because we like to write grants or that because we're super high powered business planners. And so when opportunities come up that are easy to communicate to the real people about and easy to go through the process, that is very, very important. So in some ways I'm saying, don't mess with something that's really working well. <laughs> Good, thank you, Judith. I'm seeing that we're really close to being out of time here if we wanna get, um, um, uh, if we want to get done by noon, and um, I'm, I'm reading chats at the same time, so a little distracted, but um, I want to especially thank everybody who came today. I know Bobby took the opportunity to thank you all. I want to thank all of the, the folks from the agencies, too, who you know have worked so hard to make this a, a really successful program. It's one of the best. It's, you know, whenever I have to go to um, house appropriations and make a pitch for uh, money for working lands. There's always strong support for it. Um, so thank you all and thank you farmers especially. Um, Bobby, is there anything else you would like to say? No, just that if uh, there is a problem out there not to be shy about contacting any of us or the agency heads that are here and, and uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, I think we can wrap this up for today. Um, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have all of the committees here, House Agriculture and Forestry, Senate Ag, and uh, House Commerce and Economic Development. Thank you all for joining us. And yeah. uh, with that, I think, Linda, you can take...